Uh, so uh, my name is Lucas Bernardi. I work as a data scientist in Booking.com. And today I wanted to tell you a little bit about um, how we do uh, data science in Booking, how we do apply uh, big data to improve our business. Um, before we get into that, let me tell you a little bit about the data at Booking.com. We have all types and volumes of data uh, from millions of properties, including hotels, apartments, villas, villas cabins, and all type of places where you can go and sleep. We have hundreds of millions of customers. Uh, these are actual guests that uh, booked the hotel with us and stayed at the hotel. Um, thousands of millions of transactions. Most of them are bookings, but we also have cancellations, unfortunately. Uh, customer service calls. Um, but we also have other type of data, like uh, pictures. And we have like uh, about, uh, I believe, last time I checked, 60 millions of pictures. And these pictures are both from the hoteliers who upload pictures about their properties and also from our customers, the guests that want to show what they found in the destination. And very interesting data set is our reviews. We have like also about 100 million reviews uh, from customers. This is text data, it's very complicated. And well, much more. Uh, these are just an example, a few examples uh, that I guess gives you an idea of what type and volumes of data we deal with in booking. Now, what do we do with this data? Uh, well, the most uh, obvious uh, business case for all this data is recommender systems. And we build recommender systems uh, for destinations, for hotels, but also we build recommender systems for, for dates, for example, or even for filter usage. We take the experience uh, not only about the website, but also about when you stay. So we make recommendations in place also. We help our the owners of the hotels and properties also to improve their business. Um, website personalization is also a pretty obvious case. We try to use big data to make sure that everybody sees uh, the most relevant website, the most relevant content. Uh, machine translation, we support, uh, Booking is a global company, we support uh, 42 languages, I think. We have a lot of content written in one single language. We want, want to make sure that we can uh, you know, serve this content in every language uh, that we, we can. And we try to use this automatically using machine translation. Uh, automatic user image tagging is another example of uh, computer vision problems. We have so many pictures, we try to understand what's in that picture. Is it the picture about breakfast? Is it uh, a restaurant? Is it maybe the Eiffel Tower? And we use this to improve uh, the content of, of the hotels that you see when you go to the hotel page. Um, more old school uh, data science, causal inference, which is, I believe, the key in a business like Booking.com. We want to establish relationships between causes and effects. For example, uh, what is the effect of an earthquake? How does it affect cancellations? How does it affect um, customer service tickets? Not that we can avoid the earthquake, but if we can understand what is the impact, we can prepare better. And optimization problems, for example, we have a lot of optimization problems uh, in the customer service uh, queue. So these are just examples of how do we do, uh, what do we do with all this data. Now, I wanted to tell you a little bit how we do data science, and in, in, this, in this process, um, we learn a lot. And these learnings come in, come in different shapes and formats. For example, it could be an anti-pattern, it could be a pattern good practices, standards, challenges, obstacles, all kinds of things. So I thought for this audience, it would be interesting to share uh, a couple of learnings that we have during this, 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 uh, this uh, process that took us about five years, I believe. Um, so let's, let's get straight to it. Uh, and the first learning is anti-pattern. And I titled this anti-pattern uh, as the absence of, of evidence as proof of absence. This is an anti-pattern. I know it looks like a tongue twister, but I hope uh, in a couple of minutes you will see what this means. Um, let's take a look at how do we do product development at Booking.com, which is actually a lot of fun. First of all, we come up with an idea. Uh, then uh, we convince our teammates that the idea is good. It's, it's, it's a good idea. And usually convincing one or two of your teammates is enough because our teams are small, seven or eight people. And then at some point, the idea makes it to the top of the backlog, which is what we use to prioritize. And then when it's picked up, we create what we call uh, the least if for consuming hypothesis. That still tests the idea. So let me be very concrete. Imagine you have a recommender system uh, that recommends destinations. 
And the idea, someone comes up with the idea that using location information of the user will improve the relevance of the recommendations. Um, and that's probably a good idea. And you know, we create a hypothesis that helps us to understand whether that's actually a good idea or not. And you could try to use latitude and longitude data from GPS, uh, mobile uh, uh, devices, and cross-reference it to desktop devices and stuff like that. All gets really complicated. But the idea of the least effort consuming hypothesis is that we don't go that far until we have some suspicion, at least, that the idea is actually worthy. So in this case, for example, it could be, look, if we want to understand whether location information can increase the relevance of the destination's recommendations, then just use the country of the user. The country is something that we always know. It's not uh, PII, there's no legal issues. So we can just go throw it into our machine learning algorithm and see if it increases, for example, click-through rate in this case, because we say that it will increase the relevance of the recommendation, so we expect it to increase a click-through rate. So once we have that uh, least different consumer hypothesis, we go and test it. We run an experiment, and this experiment simply split the traffic 50-50, 50% of the traffic will see the old recommender system, the other 50% will see the recommender system with the location information being used. We compute the click-through rate in both versions, and we apply statistical hypothesis testing to make sure we distinguish statistical noise from actual effects, systematic effects. Now, there are three possible results. If the experiment goes conclusive positive, that is, there is an actual effect, there is evidence of an actual effect, we are very happy, we celebrate, and we actually buy cake every time this happens. It doesn't happen that often. <laughs> and, and, yeah, and then uh, over the cake, with coffee or tea or whatever, we discuss this idea, how to follow up with it, what would be the next, uh, the next thing to do. Now, if the experiment goes conclusive negative, uh, that's bad news, of course. Um, and uh, it could be that we make a mis made a mistake in, in the way the idea was implemented, or maybe just the idea is bad. It's just a bad idea. And that requires further analysis and an iteration, and a follow-up iteration. And the worst case scenario is an inconclusive result, which is usually called a neutral result, because it's not positive, it's negative, it's neutral. Um, when we have a neutral result, we also need to go and look what happened, and uh, try to iterate the idea a little bit, and, and, and make sure we, we, we drop it only when, when we see that the idea actually doesn't work. And then we repeat this, and this is a continuous improvement or continuous development process, and uh, it's really interesting to, to work like this. It's, it's a lot of fun, and uh, I really like this process. So there's nothing wrong here. Everything is fine. But product development is not the only thing we do in Booking.com. We also do system improvement. And system improvement, an example, would be a refactor of our code. So we want to change our code so that it's more um, readable, easier to change, faster to, to develop with. Now, in this case, the process is very similar. We come up with an idea, we con convince our teammates that's a good idea, we pick it up, implement it. But in this case, there's no really a hypothesis because we are not really willing to change. We're not looking for a change in the behavior of the users. And actually, we expect the opposite. In this case, we use the, the experiment to make sure that we didn't break anything. So you change the whole system because you change from Java to Scala or whatever. And you want to make sure you didn't break anything. So we want to look at the main metrics like CTR or book through rate or cancellation rate or lifetime value, any business metric that we consider important. And we want to make sure there isn't any relevant change in them. So the way we do it is we run an experiment just like we did it with the product development in the previous slide. And if the experiment goes conclusive negative, then we're sure we, break, we broke something. And then we need to go back see what we did, fix it, and try again. Now, if the experiment goes neutral or conclusive positive, then that's good uh, news, and we can just be happy that the, the refactor didn't break anything and, and go ahead. And we're, again, we repeat this process and continuously improve our systems using this, uh, this procedure. But actually, this may turn out to, to be reasonable, uh, but it's wrong. So don't do this. And in order to understand why this is a wrong uh, practice, we need to look a little bit into how A-B testing actually works. 
And the bottom line is that A-B testing, standard A-B testing, is designed to test that A is different than B. And in the case of the refactor, we don't want to test that. We want to test that B is not worse than A. And this is slightly different, and it's quite dangerous to miss this difference. Uh, so in this slide, you can see uh, a simplified version of the actual procedure used to test uh, hypotheses when we want to check that A is better than B, for example, in, in the improvement of the recommender system. So the hypothesis is that CTR in version B is different than CTR in version A. It could be worse, it could be better, but it's different. That's our hypothesis. We want to test that. We want to make sure that's the case. So how does it work? The first step is to make an assumption. We assume that they are the same. So we assume the opposite to what we want to test. And under that assumption, we run an experiment, compute actual CTRs, observe CTRs, and we say, how likely is that I observe this difference in CTR if I assume that in reality there is no difference? So suppose that in reality there is no difference at all, and I observe a 50% difference. That's very unlikely. If in reality there isn't any difference at all, it's very unlikely that when I go and sample, I observe a 50% difference. And that means uh, our hypothesis, our assumption is wrong. And if it, our assumption is wrong, then the hypothesis must be correct. And therefore, we can conclude that there is enough evidence to say that the CTR in version B is different than CTR in version A. So now, if we fail to find evidence, we can't make any conclusion. And the reason why we cannot make any conclusion is because we are already assuming that there isn't any difference in CTR. So we cannot conclude that we are just assuming. And this is uh, quite uh, subtle, but it's uh, very important. Uh, and this absolutely invalidates this procedure uh, for the case where we want to test that B is not worse than A, which is a refactoring example. Um, so what do we do then? How do we really test that um, B is uh, not worse than A? I have time to go into details, but I want to send the message very clearly. Standard A-B tested cannot help you to test that you didn't break anything. Standard A-B testing only helps you to test that you are improving. And that's the idea behind the absence of evidence. If you fail to find a difference, it doesn't mean that there isn't any. So there are the specific approaches to test that B is not worse than A, and this has been developed in the uh, drugs industry, in the pharmaceutical industry, where they, for example, develop a new medicine uh, that is much cheaper than the previous one, and they want to prove that it's not worse Okay, you get what I mean. No, I can. Anyway, so they want to prove that it's not worse uh, health-wise uh, than the one that is already in the market. That's all they need to prove. They develop what is called a non-inferiority test, uh, which is exactly this. A very formal method, as formal as a standard A-B test, but way less popular in the uh, e-commerce or web optimization industry. It's a little bit complex to implement, but I think it's, it's by far the best. There is another approach which is much simpler, and which is this, the one that we use in, in Booking.com, which is just look at the lower bound of the confidence interval. So you look, look at the difference in, in, in CTR, for example, and you say the difference is 2%. Uh, but the, when you build the confidence interval, it says it's between 1 and 3. So it, most likely it's 2, but it could be also 1 or it could be 3. So that's good, because that means that even in the worst case scenario, it's 1% increase in CTR. So that's good. But if the confidence interval would be something like uh, minus 1, then you're running into the risk of, or losing, of losing 1% of CTR. So if you look at the lower bound of the confidence interval, if it's small enough, and you have to define what enough means, then you can go ahead with uh, quite some uh, piece of evidence that um, you didn't break anything. So this is an anti-pattern that we found. Um, to be very concrete, do not use standard A-B testing to prove that you didn't break anything. Now, moving on, that was uh, about experimentation. I wanted to present a challenge that we found uh, when we were trying to use uh, machine learning to personalize the website. And we call this challenge the graduation syndrome. Um, the idea of the graduation syndrome is that when um, people 
graduates from academia, uh, they have a way of thinking, of doing things, and then maybe they go to the industry and they feel shocked because there is a gap between what happens in the academia and what happens in the industry. Now, exactly this happens to machine learning models. You train a model in one particular context and then you use it in a different context. And if these two contexts are different, then the machine learning model also feels shocked and it doesn't work, it does bad. So to be very concrete, consider a problem where we want to tell whether a user is actually traveling for uh, leisure or for business. And we want to predict uh, the future using past data. So how do we train a model? Well, we take the past data, and past data in this case will be transactions, reservations that happened in the past. And these transactions, for some of them, we know whether the user traveled for uh, leisure or business because we asked them and they told us. But many others don't tell us. Now, this is all the past data we have, so the green box is the thing we're gonna use to train our model. So we expect that we are able to predict the circle, which is the future data. Now the future data, what is that? Well, future data is visitors. We want to predict what's the, 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 the traveling purpose of every visitor of our website. Not only of bookers, not only of people that actually tell us. We want to predict for everyone because we want to personalize the website for everyone. And we want to do this in the index page and we also want to do it in the search results page. And these two sets, well they should overlap actually, but uh, the idea is that not everybody goes through index and, and search results. Some people Google, search for a hotel, click on the hotel from Google and they book it right there. So they never see search results. And these people is significantly different than people that go to booking.com, search, browse, and then book. But we want to make predictions for all of these, these users. So the problem is that we want to learn from the L set, from the green square, to uh, predict uh, the blue circles. And unfortunately, there is a very strong statistical gap between these two um, sets. And uh, maybe a more um, clear example is if you want to train prices of houses using only data of one particular neighborhood, and then you want to use it for different neighborhoods, then this can be problematic if the neighborhoods are very different, which is usually the case. So this statistical gap really gets on the way of applying uh, machine learning for personalization. And we recognize two scenarios. And scenario number one, uh, the learned model, the, the model we train, uh, is biased because of course it's looking at one particular set. And to be very specific, we're training the model with bookers that told us whether they are training for leisure or business. And we want to use this model for everybody. And I guess you know that bookers are not the majority, right? So we are using actually a minority of data to, to, try, to train the model to predict uh, the future. So the, the model is clearly biased in the best case scenario. And if the bias is small, then the model is still valid. We can do stuff. We can, we can still use it to personalize the website. But scenario number two, which is the worst case scenario, is the learn model is absolutely overfitting L. So it's absolutely learning only to predict within that green square and cannot do anything outside that green square. And it's very difficult to observe that beforehand. So when we put the model in production to predict for the future, it just doesn't work. And the model therefore is invalid. And the general conclusion is that in general, label dependent metrics um, are not uh, representative. If you train on the green square and this how oh, the precision of my model is 90%, well, that's really not representative. And that really gets on the way of a very uh, common technique used in machine learning, which is cross-validation, which is used to evaluate models offline and to make sure the model is doing something sensible. Now, I don't have a solution for this challenge, so if anybody have a, a suggestion, I would be more than happy to hear. Uh, we, we didn't get there yet, but we are in a position where we can distinguish whether we are in scenario one or scenario two. And that's very helpful because that uh, saves us uh, a lot of, of, of work uh, trying to, to improve something that is actually impossible. Um, if you want to, I, I, I cannot go into that, I don't have much time, but there is a, a, a talk I gave in PyData 
a uh, couple of months ago where I explained how we actually distinguish between scenario one and scenario two. You can go and look it up in YouTube. And the last one, I only have five minutes, so I'm gonna have to speak up. A pattern. So I gave you an anti-pattern and a challenge. So I thought I'd rather talk about something that actually works. Um, out of core pipelines. And I'm sure this audience is quite familiar with this. It's really scary. Uh, the first time I saw this is from 2014, I believe. I, I, this is 2016. I didn't, f I didn't find the one from this year. I don't know if it's, is there any. Uh, but 2014, it was really, really much less crowded than this. And the guy that showed me this, uh, I told him, hey, <laughs> do I need to learn all of this to, do, to be a big data guy? And he told me, no, 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 don't worry. You only need to choose the good ones. And, 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 and that's it. And I said, but that's even worse. I need to choose the good ones out of all these. And, okay, there's nothing wrong with this, uh, but indeed it's very scary. If you're starting on, on big data, this is really, really scary. So I wanted to give a, a complementary view of this big data landscape, uh, which is the following. And I, I really hope and I take it that mo many of you are very familiar with this amazing platform frameworks and, and, and tools uh, for big data. And this is a little bit of a joke. But you know what they say, every, every joke has a little bit of truth. And I, I really use this a lot, much more than many other tools out there. Now, the pattern that I wanted to present relies on this idea. And what is the, what is the problem that we're trying to solve with this pattern? Well, the, try, the problem we're trying to solve is to train a machine learning uh, model using uh, a pretty large uh, data set that is stored in some data warehouse outside. Uh, and when we build this statistical model, well, we need to perform several uh, stages, several tasks like fetching the data, cleaning the data, feature selection, model fitting, hyperparameter search, you name it. There are many things that we, we need to do to get one single model out there. So uh, the idea of the pattern is the following. The structure says that uh, every single uh, stage of the pipeline is represented by a script. Simple script. Now, scripts have a responsibility, which is to play nice with memory. They read the standard input, they write the standard output, and they play nice with memory. Uh, ideally, they have a constant complexity in memory. This is, of course, too much. But if the memory consumption is sublinear with the amount of rows, we are fine. And they process the data row by row, or in batches. And we use pipe and T to you know, connect the different stages of the pipeline. Um, we use the hard drive just as a, as a cache to connect the different pipelines if we have more than one for one single model. And then we use out of core learning algorithms and implementations. So let's look at a concrete example. I don't know if you can see anything over there, probably not. But the idea here is that you can, we're trying to train a model, use it to predict something, and then evaluate how it works. And here, I'm using Hive to get the data. Hive is, is our data warehouse. We get the data, we pipe it through the first script, that what it does is cleans the data, removes uh, outliers and stuff like that. Uh, for example, we want to remove reservations that are fraudulent. If we know that they are fraudulent, we just remove them. Um, we apply a feature extraction script, uh, then we pipe that through a formatter, and then finally we pipe it through uh, Vopa Wabbit, which is one of my favorite machine learning tools, which is an out-of-core learning tool and that plays very nicely with memory indeed. And it's super fast. And then we predict, which is uh, again the same, a little bit different, uh, because in this case we need to compute also the, the predicted and, and, and the expected uh, values of the target, the thing we want to predict. And finally we evaluate computing AUC, which is a very simple script that computes a metric called AUC. This is just a toy example. Uh, if you are interested, I can show you more in my computer. But what I wanted to illustrate with this is, are the consequences. And the first one is the scalability, uh, which is this idea of memory not really uh, very decoupled from the amount of rows. So if your scripts play nice with memory, you can scale really well in the amount of rows. And when I mean really well, I mean I train models in, not in this one, a very similar laptop, with 800 million rows 
in a matter of hours, like two or three hours. Um, and it's very efficient because all these tasks are independent processes. And therefore, to, provided the operating system is clever enough, uh, one pipeline will actually use a lot of uh, CPUs. And that's very uh, efficient, and that's, well, I believe it's good. And the two that I like the most is this idea of separation of concerns, uh, which is a, a concept borrowed from probably aspect-oriented uh, programming. Um, every script really has a very distinct responsibility. You write a script to do feature selection. You write a script to get the data. You write a script to clean the data. You don't mix all these things. And this is super, super interesting uh, consequence because this allows us to really combine things very easily. And that leads us to this idea of ex extensibility. And I'm always amazed by, by, by these, these tools, this big data landscape, uh, that uh, these are all independently developed tools. T, CAD, SET, GREP, all these tools are completely independently developed. But the level of interoperability is just amazing. The, how easy it is to integrate one thing with another, I'm, it's, it's really, I'm puzzled by it. I mean, I've seen people trying to do this with one single language, with one single way of, of programming, one single, and they fail. And these guys manage uh, to actually interoperate without even talking to each other or even knowing about each other. Uh, so this gives us uh, a very interesting uh, legacy, which is the ability to, to extend. You can develop your own tools. You can develop your own uh, um, scripts or your own T if you don't like how T works. For example, uh, we, we have our own shuffle and our own sort. And this allows us to really integrate things uh, with each other. Um, so I hope you like this pattern. I, the, the idea of showing this is endorsing this way of working and establishing the fact that it works. We use it in Booking.com a lot. Uh, it's not the only way we work. Of course, this doesn't scale to uh, infinite data. For those cases like uh, image uh, computer vision, for example, we use other tools like uh, Spark and, 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 and TensorFlow and stuff like that. But uh, if you are on the scale of millions of, of rows, these patterns works uh, very good. So I just wanted to, to to establish this, this idea. Um, and that's all I, I have. Uh, we're hiring, so if you're interested, just uh, send me an email or something. And um, thanks a lot. <laughs>